So, for this second video for the lesson number 2 in module number 1, we'll talk about the four major philosophers of science and we'll try to understand how these four philosophers um, try to describe what science is as a phenomenon and how uh, science flourishes across history. But before we talk about the different philosophies of science let's talk about the types of science of course we have the natural sciences which basically talks about you know the natural reality and we also have social sciences basically these are the sciences that talks about human behaviors in relation to societal forces of course example of natural sciences we have biology physics chemistry and for social science we have economics political science psychology and sociology and anthropology Okay, so the first philosopher that we're going to be talking about is Karl Popper. According to Popper, what makes a discipline, a scientific field of study, is falsification. According to Popper, a certain field of study or a certain body of knowledge is scientific when scientists can create studies or experiments to be able to falsify a certain truth within that body of knowledge. For example, we consider general relativity theory as a scientific theory and we consider Freudian psychoanalysis as a pseudo-scientific theory. Because general relativity theory can be falsified by experiments and there are other theories that try to negate the arguments of general relativity theory. But unlike other scientific theories, Freudian psychoanalysis could not be considered as, you know, a solid scientific theory because it's hard to falsify the arguments that are made by Freudian psychoanalysis. I mean, we could say that, you know, our addiction for uh, drugs or smoking or alcohol is connected to oral fixation in relation to some psychosexual underdevelopment or misdevelopment and our relationship with our parents in the past. But it's hard to say that it is not because it's hard to make a counterfactual of our lives because we cannot, you know, clone ourselves and go back in time and, you know, present ourselves in a different scenario within our family and we cannot really, you know, do a counterfactual or a control group for our ego, id, and super ego. So to really say that these things aren't true. So uh, in relation to other psychological theories that are more scientific in nature, like for example, neuropsychology or cognitive psychology, Psychoanalytic theory by Freud is more pseudoscientific because, again, it lacked the component of falsification. And in this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have observed how the scientific com community has been skeptical of itself, how it has periodically corrected itself when it is presented by new evidences. For example, in January, we were told, oh, you're not supposed to wear a mask if you are not feeling any symptoms because it really won't help protect you from the virus anyway. So do not wear a mask anymore. It's useless. It's just a waste of resources. However, eventually, we were able to find out, we were able to gather evidence that asymptomatic transmission, meaning transmitting the virus without you uh, experiencing any symptoms, is evident and possible. And that's the reason now the scientific community, WHO, has suggested that we should wear masks because assuming that we have the virus and we are asymptomatic, we might be able to transfer our virus to other people and we have to wear a mask. Not because we are going to protect ourselves, but because we want to make sure that the droplets that we produce when we exhale or when we talk does not spread in the environment and infect the people who are close to us. Okay, so the next philosopher of science is Imre Lakatos and he introduced the importance of what we call a research program. And a research program is a network of scientists conducting research on a central hardcore. So we can consider a science a science if there is a body of scientists working together in order for it to flourish. So for example, now we have a specific set of study or discipline of tourism. But way back 
in the 1960s, tourism was something that it was studied as a phenomenon under sociology or a phenomenon under business studies. However, because there were scientists or network of scientists who were able to produce theoretical frameworks for uh, tourism in the 1980s, tourism was considered to be a science or a discipline of its own. And that's the reason now we have a specific educational track for tourism where in fact way before, wala naman ganon. And research programs are very important in the flourishing of the science and to be able to branch out to more specific sets of science. And a good discipline in science has a global network of research programs. Like when you go around the world, there is a scientist that holds the same discipline or the same field of study that, you know, these studies communicate with each other in order to make flourish that discipline or field of study. So for instance, applying it to the COVID-19 situation, we all need a vaccine because it's so difficult to achieve herd immunity without a lot of deaths happening. And there are so many research hubs all over the world trying to race against time in order to create these vaccines. While it is true that this is a competition uh, corporations versus corporations of pharmaceuticals but we can also see this as you know a science community at work because even if they are competitor uh, pharmaceutical companies they also share their results with one another so that they will be able to create a good enough vaccine for everyone and the next philosopher of science that we will discuss is Paul Carl Freire Bend and the main concept that has been pushed forward by this Austrian philosopher is epistemological anarchism. So epistemological anarchism argues that there are no useful and exception-free methodological rules governing the progress of science or the growth of knowledge. And according to him, science should be like this, that we should always welcome new ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of testing theories, new ways of developing theories, and if we don't allow that in sciences to happen, then we are detrimental to the growth of science itself. And finally, one of the major philosophers of science is Thomas Samuel Kuhn. According to Kuhn, scientific progress entails periodic paradigm shifts rather than solely progressing in a linear and continuous way. So according to Thomas Kuhn, uh, there are many cycles that a, uh, that a science goes through in order for it to flourish. So first, it goes to a pre-paradigmatic state, meaning it's not considered as a science yet. Like for example, yung binigay kong example kanina, tourism. No? In 1960s, it wasn't considered as a science or a body of knowledge in itself, but we now know in 2000, because of the research programs that has been done and the theories that guide it, it is now known as a specific set of studies. And then, after that, science goes to a normal science. When we say normal science, this is the time in a field of study wherein, you know, it has established its methodologies, established its theories, and there is a linear growth of knowledge. However, according to Kuhn, what defines a good scientific progress is that there should be scientific revolutions or paradigmatic shifts happening within a scientific field of study. So, for example, in the field of physics, for a very long time, we followed the Newtonian way of understanding the nature of the universe. But in the 1990s, we have discovered quantum physics and this has totally defined, redefined the way we see atoms and subatomic particles and even larger scale of things in the universe are interacting with each other. And this has caused a lot of breakthroughs in the field of physics. Paradigmatic shifts can also be seen in other disciplines, like for example, in the study of business. Many, many years ago, marketing was very selling-centric. You know? So the goal of marketing was to make people know about your product, make sure that they have access to it, make sure that they buy it or they purchase the services, and you gain profit from it. It was very one-sided, you know, the gain of the company or the brand. 
However, in not so recently, uh, marketing has undergone a paradigm shift as well from being a selling-centric perspective to a more customer satisfaction centric perspective. So now it's not just enough that we get to sell our products to them, but it's more important that we are able to satisfy their needs. We're able to get what they want because that's a more long-term uh, goal for our companies, for our brands, for our products that instead of gaining money from your customers, you gain a good relationship with your customer. So that's the more uh, recent view of marketing and not just, not just about selling. Okay, so that is kind of a short summary of the major assumptions of the four philosophers of science that we have discussed. I know that when you go to their specific readings, you'll be able to see a lot more assertions and illustrations, but I kind of just laymanized their arguments to some points that may be relatable to us. So I know all of you are gearing towards your own majors, which are either in the arts and in the sciences, but definitely these are, you know, legitimate fields of study. And I'd like to invite you to draw insights from the history of how your disciplines were developed and see how these philosophers could explain the way your discipline that you are trying to um, achieve you know, in your major is uh, influenced or shaped by the assumptions and assertions of these theories.